this video a conversation that I had with Tobias shortly before this session began. I was working on the book Road Trip, which is the current book that we hope to have published shortly. As I was editing it, I questioned Tobias about the fact that the way he talked might be a little obscure for people on Earth, and I don't like to tell them what to say because that's up to them. I am usually very careful about preserving uh, the communications from heaven's side exactly as I received them, but I was questioning at this point if people on earth would be able to understand what he was saying and if it could be, it might be wise to alter it a little bit. And he'd already made a couple little corrections before we had this discussion. So I, when I began the session today, before we started recording, while we were waiting for everyone to get settled, I was explaining to them about this conversation that I had had with Tobias. And therefore, I think it would help to put it in be, into this uh, video as I recorded it audibly in order to help understand some of the things that were said in this video. So I'm going to include it here if you for any reason want to skip this part because it does go for about 10 minutes or so uh, and just get to the video of the session today, you can do that. Um, however, if you're willing to listen to this, I think it will help you to understand some of the things that are said in the session. Thank you very much for listening. Do people there understand these things? Because people here don't. People in heaven understand what I'm saying because they can see the problem from here. People on earth cannot understand it because they are trusting on a way of justifying their actions. So that's the difference here, is that people here don't have a problem understanding what I'm saying. That you have to see the results of your actions if you're going to understand how destructive they are. And so the people on earth don't see this because they don't have an expanded point of view. So they are continuously going through the same door even though it leads them into the fate of hate, which is destruction, war, starvation, mass killings, etc., etc. They just can't see it, so they keep blindly going through the same door. But yes, the people here in heaven do understand that. It just gets lost when they come back to earth because they are trained by their parents and their society not to understand. Because if they understood what we're saying here, then they would block the doors with their bodies and say, hey, don't go through that door because it leads to horrible consequences. However, the people on earth don't want to know it because if they did know it, they would have to block the door and others would blow them away in order to get through that door. So until everybody understands it, the ones who figure it out are going to be continually blown away by the others who just want to take the easy route, which is to keep living in stupidity and hate. It's just the way it is. So there have to be enough people who will block the door and say, we've gone through this door so many times. Don't you get it? It will just lead to another war. 
and or the destruction of the earth and of humanity because eventually God says well you haven't figured it out and so we'll just wipe you out and I'll start a new game and that will be the end of humanity but they can't figure it out because they are so afraid of being the ones that stand in front of the door and get blown away you see the ones who stand in front of the door and get blown away by the fools who can't understand that the reason they're standing in front of the door is to save them from the horror that awaits them so they just keep killing them over and over again or they destroy them in some other way by taking away their platform so they can't speak to others and get others to stand in front of the door this is the horror that we see from here and why people here in heaven would not bar the door any more than those on earth because they also know that they're going to go back to earth and have to go through that door again and again and again because they have not begun to redeem their energy on a new synergy so they just keep going through the door and they can sit here in heaven and see it but they know they're going to go to earth and go through that door so it's like saying you're watching yourself go through the door to hell again and again and again and you can't do anything about it because you are on the karmic wheel and you're going to keep going around on the karmic wheel until you figure it out while you're on earth you got to figure it out while you're on earth that's the key you got to figure it out while you're there and people are not getting it Steph well here's what I think I think you guys got to be clear enough about this I know it's kind of ambiguous to these people they're not getting it tasting the vibration on earth is like saying that we find it so obvious here and we need you to help us see what people there cannot see so that we can adjust the way we talk to them so thank you for sharing that perspective and don't be afraid to tell us how you see it because we need to have your point of view as well thank you so are you saying to me and I'm appreciating this conversation are you saying to me that the people there can see what's happening however they already are aware that if they stand in front of the door they're going to have to be blown away because they're going to have the karmic uh, balance for the fact that they blew others away yes so they already know if they stand in front of the door they're going to be blown away and the only hope to get off this mass karmic wheel is for the people who are thinking they have to blow away the ones who are standing in front of the door to grow enough to realize that those people are in the front of the door in order to save them not to punish them and so they have to stop blowing away the people who are standing in front of the door and that means if they were one of the ones that stood in front of the door and got blown away and they condemned the ones who blew them away then they would have to be part of the ones who are blowing away the ones standing in front of the door so they keep going round and round and round however if it comes to the point where they get blown away and they just say well I deserve that no problem I still love you which is the lesson Jesus tried to teach on the cross then they will no longer be on the karmic wheel and therefore they won't have to come back and be somebody who blows 
away the ones that are standing in front of the door. They won't have to become what they condemned. They will just say, well, thank you, I love you, I'll be back another day. And I'll still be there to stand in front of the door to keep you from killing yourself and from keeping humanity on the karmic wheel. And so they will not suffer any consequences because they will have found peace and harmony in their hearts and they will therefore ascend into a different vibration. So it's just a different vibration that they will experience and they will no longer feel the fear of death, you see. And the ones who blew them away will still stay on the karmic ground until they figure it out and they say, well, these people that are standing in front of the door, and we can't go through the door, we'll just let them be and we'll try to figure out why they're standing in front of the door instead of just blowing them away. And then people will get off the karmic ground, humanity will be able to save itself, and there will not be a need for God to eventually just wipe them all out because they haven't figured it out. I mean, there is a certain period of time, you might say, for God's patience as well. Thank you. At this point, we jump to the Saturday group session. William Wordsworth is here. And I have a chapter in the book Road Trip that is coming out in which I discuss something very important to me. And what I talk about is the day when I talked to three Native Americans, what we called Indians in those days, who came to England as kind of a display of the their particular lifestyle. And I had a talk with them and they told me that they deserved what they got because they forgot a very important lesson. They knew that they had to live in harmony with the world around them, with the animals and the plants in the world, natural world. And they were well aware of the nature of the heaven and earth rotation. And so they weren't afraid of dying because they knew they would just go up into this, the spirit world where they would be happy until they return. And so because of this, they became very fierce warriors because they didn't have to worry about dying because they'd just be taken up into the spirit world until they came back again in another body. So they were well aware of the heaven and earth rotation. However, what they forgot was that although they lived in harmony with the beasts of the land and the ocean, etc., and the streams and the trees and the forests, lands and the <clears throat> wide open spaces of the plains, they forgot what the spirit people told them. The spirit told people told them they needed to live in harmony with each other and not fight each other. And yet they warred among themselves all the time. And it even became a source of pride to be a great warrior. How many other people you killed? And so because they forgot that they had to not only live in harmony with the animals and the natural world around them, they forgot that they had to live in harmony with the rest of humanity, that even though someone was born into a different tribe, did not mean that they deserved to die. And so they brought upon themselves the catastrophe to their way of life because they had chosen strife between them. And so I said to them, well, what do you hope then for your people? And they told me 
very tingly now. This is Steph. I'm extremely tingly. They told me, we hope for our people that they stop blaming the white man and they take responsibility for their own demise because they chose it. And it is the same thing for all people that you can stop whining about what happened to you. And this goes for the Jews as well. It goes for every people that have had to face their worst fears because the worst fears that you've faced were inside of you all along. And so eventually God says, well, how about this? This is what you gave and this is what you shall receive. So what you give, you shall receive. So do not forget the lessons of these three gentle Native Americans with whom I spoke at length because I was so curious in that day and age about what they had to say. Do not forget their words, for their words were meant for humanity to help them understand that if they keep going through that door, they are going to end up reaping the only reward they gave to others, which was death and destructive energy. So thank you for listening to me. Does anyone have any questions for me while I'm here? Yeah, you said it's, it is uh, for everybody to receive. So the slaves that was taken from Africa and brought to America and other countries as slaves, it was the same for them. Well, the destruction of a way of life, destructive energy in itself is created through the mass consciousness you see. And so it depends upon the mass consciousness. But every individual has a opportunity to balance their own energy. So, for instance, someone might have been taken slave and under another in order to have the opportunity to forgive their oppressors. The prime example we have, of course, is Steph's own experience when she was so badly beaten, raped, and nearly killed again and again in World War II because she believed that love was greater than hate. She never hated her oppressors. However, she could not understand why God did not show his hand and save the ones who did not hate. And it was only after she died that she had the opportunity to understand that love is not greater than hate and good is not greater than evil because there is only love, you see. There is only love and there is only good. This is a little tricky for people to understand that just because you stand in front of the door does not mean that you hate. It does not mean that you are evil or that you are facing evil. You are simply making a choice for love, you see. You are simply making a choice for good. And so if you say to people, if you go through this door, it's going to cost you more. So give up your religiosity. Give up your fake trust on those people who would lead you astray. It does not mean you hate the people who would lead you astray. It only means that you have something to say because you've come to see that love is all there is, that good is all there is. And so because Steph learned that lesson, she can say, hey, I like it that way. I don't have a problem that they killed me in World War II, even though she chose her own death. She did so under the most painful circumstances in order to be free at last from the hatred 
of those who could not see her humanity. And therefore, she came to see that reality sometimes requires us to be the slave or the Native American who loses his way of life or the one that people behead or crucify because this is the trust on love, you see. It is the trust that I can be free of anxiety because I know that I'm an eternal being and that I love my fellow humans enough to simply say, hey, don't go through that door, please. And if you go through that door, then you won't like what's in store. And if you have to heal me, heal me. That's okay. Because it isn't going to make me be afraid to say, don't go through that door. You see? Now, any questions? <clears throat> questions. Um, first of all, when, when we do die, and if we die, <clears throat> you know, a, a violent death, does it hurt? Do we actually feel the tremendous pain be because of watching so many um, near-death experiences? They all say that they're taken out of their body before they actually feel that the pain. You know, I, I think that gives great comfort to, to moms who, who have lost their children, say, in drowning or in a fire, that they didn't actually feel that the physical pain of it all. When it is time for you to die, you will leave your body. If you leave your body, there's no pain because it's the body that registers the pain. Right. However, many people do feel a lot of pain before they die. But once you're dead and you leave your body, there's no more pain. You can leave your body anytime you want. You can leave your body anytime you want. If you are trusting on your ability to be free of pain and you are in pain, you just trust on your ability to not fight it, you see. Just let yourself go, fly free. And then you'll come back to your body when you're ready and don't worry about it. However, because people resist the idea, of flying free because they think they are their body, they may suffer tremendously. But for someone who is in a violent accident, suddenly that takes their life or they drown, there's just the feeling of peaceful resignation to the next step in their experience. You see? And, um, also, Stephanie, if we're in the third dimension. Can I just um, a minute? Who's talking? Hold on just a minute, Susan. I just yeah. want to know who's talking. Tobias is here right now. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, if, if we're in the third dimension where we are experiencing the negativity, um, you know, the not realizing that we're all connected, we're all one. Um, and we're all created in the image and likeness of, of um, God, um, that we will continue on creating the, the you know, the, the wars and the fighting and the pollution and, and all of that until we, until we ascend into a higher dimension. You know, as they're saying now, this is, we're so lucky to be here. This is the great awakening was supposed to be, you know, descending. Susan, Susan, let us interrupt you just a moment. Yeah. We don't know who the we you're talking about is. It might be helpful if you said I, because it's your perspective. Okay. So because not all people have the same perspective as you do. Really? <laughs> um, so I, um, assuming that I'm going to, have more knowledge being in a higher dimension so that I wouldn't contribute to, you know, all the negativity that's going on in the world. 
Um, so that's what, that's what I'm assuming that I am supposedly be going into a great awakening, all of us as humanity, humanity into a higher dimension so that there will be, as it is in heaven on earth, peace on earth. Um, that's, that's all I got right now. <laughs> is, is there a question in there? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm assuming that because we're in such lower dimensions that we, we continue to um, oh, oh, oh. you assume that because you are in a lower dimension, you continue to. I continue to. Well, I'm assuming that um, others are in a lower dimension in order for them to continue to to create wars, to uh, not care about the planet, to pollute. Um, OK, there's a little tricky thing here. Okay, you have to understand it has to do with the duality and the dichotomy of experience. Okay, is that when you look around you and you see people doing certain things, you make assumptions about them. But how do you know that they're not the ones that God appointed to teach you the lesson you need to learn? Okay. In <clears throat> other words, if you need to learn not to go through the door, it's going to take a bunch of people who contribute to the mass consciousness to create the wars that will say to you, hey, what's going on here? Why is it this way? That doesn't mean that they are not the perfect representations for you of what not to do. Does that make sense to you? So when you have a point of view, it's your point of view or your Trust on reality. And therefore, it's going to include what you see around you, what you assume about other people, but it's going to be your assumptions. And so we're just trying to make that distinction clear so that you know you have to be aware of another point of view, which may be what you're saying, that when you're only in one point of view, you call it a lower dimension, and therefore, you will not understand what I'm saying. But if you raise your vibration so that you can see it from another point of view, you will come to see that everything you experience is your reality. And when others behave like you, then it's like looking in the mirror and saying, whoa, we all do this, we all do that. But can you stand there and instead of look in the mirror, look through the bay window? Does this make sense to you? Yes. So right now you're telling us that you're in what you consider a lower dimension. And you call it a 3D dimension. So is that where you want to stay? Of course not. Okay. Then I would suggest you start looking through the bay window, <laughs> not in the mirror. And you would say, hey, this is how I feel today. I don't know how everybody else feels. I don't really care because I'm not them. I'm me. Does that make sense to you? Mm-hmm. Right. However, if I have any reaction to them, that tells me something. And that tells me that we're here to play and that they are helping me by throwing me the ball. And now the question is, am I going to let it hit me on the noggin so I can get the walk? Or am I going to take the swing? See if I can get a home run. So everybody around you is throwing you the ball. And it's up to you if you take the swing to see if you can get the home run or if you're just going to go for the walk, step in front of the ball, and let it hit you, and then whine and say, well, you hit me, you hit me. I'm not sure if this is making sense to you yet, Susan, is it? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Okay, we'll try again. Ask another question. <sighs> And while we're waiting, is it making sense to the rest of you? If not, feel free to, add, to raise a question. Go ahead, Susan. Um, I'm, I'm just, I guess I want to get off the wheel. I mean, we just keep, I mean, we could be, keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. So I guess, is this forever that we we come here to to learn? I mean, to make the world a better place, and then die, and then go back, and then come back. And I, I, do you know what I'm saying? Well, we don't know if it will always be the same, because that's subject to change. Life is change. However, if you're an eternal being, you're an eternal being, and we refer to it as the circle of life, and not the circle of karma. It's what you want to make it. Because what you give, you receive because you're God, you see? So you give to yourself and you receive what you give to yourself. Simple. <clears throat> this is the fractal nature of God, you see? It's like looking at a mirror that has been splintered into a million pieces, or a billion. And the question is, is it just reflecting back to each other through a dark glass or are you going to clean off your glass so that you can reflect the light you see because the light still penetrates the night the light is still there the light still burns in your heart you see but if you let the light in your heart go out what are you reflecting to the rest of humanity? These are images that may be a little difficult to understand from a place in a dark land. However, the light is slowly growing. So don't get frustrated, Susan, because we're here for you and we're shining the light into the night because every time it hits something that reflects us back to us, we say, hey, that must have been something we laid there one day. That must have been a thought we put out there that someday we'd see the light, you see? So you keep shining the light for the day when it comes back to you. We're still here for you, Susan, so feel free to ask further to um, try to understand this. I, I just um, I just want the pain and the suffering to end. Um, the pain and suffering for you? For me for my loved ones, for, for humanity. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Why would you care if your loved ones are having pain and suffering? Because I love them. Okay, so what's your definition of love? That you suffer for them? Well, well, I do suffer for them when they hurt. I do. I, I, I feel their pain. I, I, I suffer. My mom died. I, I'm still grieving. I'm still grieving the loss of my mom. Um, okay, but it's not your mother that's suffering. It's you that's suffering then. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it's, it's it, I guess it's a selfish thing, right? Um because assuming she's at peace and whatever they do um, up there. Uh, it is a way of avoiding the truth. The truth is that you are suffering because you are afraid. Yes, I am afraid. All I've right, let's talk about your fears because that's where we need to go. If you truly 
want to stop suffering, if you want to hold on to your fears, because it makes you feel better to be afraid and hide in your dark corner, that's fine. That's your choice. We're not trying to pull you out of your dark corner if that's where you are. However, if you truly want to suffer no more, then it's time to come out of the dark corner and face your fears. So let's talk about your fears. What are you afraid of? Everything. I, I believe I was born thank you with for that, that offer. That, thank you for that clear statement. I believe I was born with fear. If ever since I have memory, probably as little as two that I can remember, I was afraid of the dark. I was afraid of water. I was afraid of heights. I mean, you name it. I was afraid of it. Okay, now what are you afraid of, though? It's not the dark you're afraid of. It's what's hiding in the dark, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. And what are you afraid is hiding in the dark? Um, some, some creature that's going to, you know, like the boogeyman, I guess. Um, All right. Very good. Have you ever seen the boogeyman? No, but I've seen movies. <laughs> the movies are great because they bring our fears to the surface. Right. Right. So, I have to tell you, Steph, this is one of Steph's stories, that when she was a child, she went to see a movie in the little theater in Homer, Alaska, and it was called The Creature of the Black Lagoon. <laughs> and she was about seven or eight, and she went with her siblings, and she ended up hiding under a chair. It was so frightening. She remembered it for years and years, the creature that came out of the Black Lagoon. And when she was older, she happened to find a rerun on TV and she watched it and she laughed. It was so <laughs> funny. It didn't even look realistic. It was like one of those early grade B movies <laughs> where they just put a mask on somebody and it was so obvious. And she laughed and laughed to think that it had frightened her. So what do you think you would do if you saw what had frightened you? Um, probably see it for what it is. <clears throat> um, and, you know, I, I, I guess they, they say in order to conquer the fears, you have to walk through it. Um, yeah, but they, but I, I mean, it's just life itself. It's just life itself, everything in it, um, you know, driving, you know, I'm going on a trip with my kids and, and I'm thinking, oh my God, what if we get into a car accident? You know what I mean? I mean, it's just, it's just projecting always, always, always fear. And, um, and then, uh, you know, of course my religion played a huge part of that um, growing up. You know, not being good enough, always thinking that I was going to be condemned to hell. Um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty scary thing. Um, Can we suggest to you that what you're really afraid of is that God is dead? Okay. Think, think about that a minute. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If God is dead, then you're dead. Right. right. You're right. dead in the water. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense because, <clears throat> you know, I always thought I had to see to believe. That's what we were taught. You know, you just have to believe. And, and, and I've, you know, asked him many, many times if he would show himself. And I'm sure if he sat on the edge of my bed, I would be scared. <laughs> so. Um, well, are you are you scared of us? Here in this group? No, I'm not afraid of you. You're looking in the face of God. And that's that's what I try to do when I see people that rub me the wrong way to, to take a look and see that they are the face of God. 
and never to forget you are the face of God. And so you see, if you think God is dead, it's like saying that you think you're dead. And that's got to be very confusing. Because how can you be alive if you're dead? Right. And so it's so confusing that it tortures the mind of those who cannot understand that life is its own purpose. Life is not here for you to gain fame and fortune. Life is not here for you to prove that God is dead. Life is not here for you to suffer because somebody died. Life is not here for you to have to tell other people what to do. Life is here to live, you see? It's the only purpose. The only purpose is to be life. But but that's our human condition, Steph, uh, that when we when our loved ones die, that we grieve. I mean, there's I don't know. Very all right. Many all right. So let's so grieve, grieve right now. Grieve, please. So you can get it out of your system. Would you please grieve? So tell me about grieving. How are you doing it? I'll cry. Thank you for being vulnerable and honest. So cry, please. And everybody needs to understand this. Crying is perfectly natural. It's not unnatural. So go ahead and cry and grieve. It might take me a while. That's all right. It's all right. We've got all the time in the world because we have eternity, you see. We have eternity to be here for our friends. That's what we have life for. Thank you. Is to live and not to shun life. And you, in your grief, are alive, you see. Yes. <clears throat> if you allow yourself to grieve, to cry, to shudder, that's okay. Because God made you that way. However, if you resist your grieving, it will persist. And therefore, allow yourself to grieve. There's nothing wrong with that. It's very natural. And it's very humbling for the rest of us to make space for someone to grieve. So is there a, a timetable on, on grieving? Um, you, you... Well, you tell us. And when you're done grieving, tell us. In the meantime, just enjoy it. Enjoy the tears. Enjoy the feelings in your body. Because that's what you came here for. That's what life is about. That's why God gave you a body. Because it was a decision that we all made together, you see. That all the parts of God made together. To experience this reality. So that they could celebrate God, you see. So that's why we're here, 
to love him, to know him, and to serve him in this world. And you serve us. Susan, you're reminding us to grieve and accept it and not worry about it. And then we will be free of the hatred that has come to us when we thought we were flawed, you see. Because that was part of the game, you see, to hide the ball, to make us forget that we created this game and that we like to play it. However, it got kind of mean because some of the game became how to shame and blame others. And that's not the way the game was initially set up, you see. So how are you feeling, Susan? <clears throat> Better. Thank you for letting me share. I love you, Susan. I understand grief. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. You're so Thank great. you for sharing with us, Susan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is beautiful. We need to feel our feelings, and that has been my path to understand more. <laughs> Love bad feelings. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. What makes it so difficult when you're grieving is the people that pat you on the back and say, oh, I know how you feel, and they really don't give a shit how you feel. They just want to tell you something that will satisfy you so they can run away and hide in their own dark corners. Very few people understand that grieving is an experience that you came here to experience. And that through that grieving, we all share in the love that you have for your mother. Thank you. Anybody else have thoughts? Uh, I have learned that only through allowing the feelings to come forth, I could heal. And kind of, I learned to embrace the part of me that was hurt, that felt all this abandonment and all this lack of love and caring. So by embracing them and then actually go into them, it, it has been, it taken some time, but it's, it's very. I, I don't regret regret anything. They are the ones that has made me to who I am today. So thank you. You gave us a beautiful gift, Susan. By sharing with us, I'm so tingly right now. The tingles are just flowing from my head to my feet, <laughs> which probably indicates that your mother's here because that's usually what happens. But you have given us so much hope <clears throat> without realizing it because you allowed us to sit here and share with you <clears throat> the feelings that were going through you, which we never could have done if you hadn't been willing to share that way. Right? Right. Yeah. And that creates a link between all of us that can never be undone. We don't have to say, oh, you poor thing. Because you see, every one of us has had to 
experienced grief as well. And sometimes we resisted it and sometimes it persisted. And sometimes we had a group of friends that said, we're here for you and we have space for you because we've been there too. We know what it feels like to lose a mother, a child, a brother, a sister. Thousands of times over, because we've all lived thousands of lives. So thank you, Susan, for sharing with us. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me. Can I share a story about when my mother died? Yes. Short one? Um, well, I had a complicated relation to her during most of my life. Um, but in the, at the end of her life, she got dimen um, dementia. And I saw finally the real person when all of that stuff that she was as a person, as a, my mother, I saw her soul. So I could forgive her. And that was the first time I really felt how much I loved her because I had had troubles loving her. So when she died, I went to the funeral and I, I comforted my father and, you know, so I didn't cry. And then when I drove home with my daughter, she had fall, fallen asleep in the car. I drove out in the woods, parked the car, and went out a bit far from the car so my daughter wouldn't hear me. And then I just cried out of my lungs, you know, mother, you know, like this. Oh, it was so good. It, I, I just... It was just like steam, letting steam out. Got yeah. back to the car. It was in the middle of the night. I think it was 11 p.m. or something, 11.30. And suddenly there is a car, and I'm out in the wilderness. Suddenly there is a car pulling up to the parking lot where I have parked my car. And I got scared, you know. I say, like, who is this? Is somebody coming to hurt us. And I saw the person lowering their window and there was this woman leaning forward saying, I'm gonna cry now. Do you need help? No. <laughs> and I started to cry then and I said, no, thank you. <laughs> right. No. And it just felt like it was my mother comforting. Yeah. Yes. Showing that she is with you. She's with us. Every one of the the lost lost ones, they are still with us. Right. Right. I just wanted to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, for sharing that. That was beautiful. Thank you too for sharing your story. Yeah. Pablo Picasso is here. And I also had a complicated relationship with my mother. Because although I loved her very much, I hated the fact that she was so beaten down by my father's attitudes and by the way that she was so imbued with the religiosity in which she had grown up. And I could not make her see that she needed to stand up and be responsible for her own life and not allow others to take from her her own power to decide for herself how she would live 
And so I would get very frustrated with her. And of course, I did not adhere to any religious thought. And I fought back with a vengeance against all those people that I thought were so stupid as to trust on life after death. I was very materialistic, you might say. And I did play a very, very dark game. And I have to say that when I came here, I had to cry many a tear to think that I did not understand that I was no smarter than her, you see, because I threw out the baby with the bathwater. I didn't believe in God because I didn't believe in the God that decided who would go to heaven and who would go to hell. And so I gave it all up, you see. And after I came here, I came to see something very, very important. My mother and I, you see, have a very, very deep soul bond. So deep, in fact, that we had to be the opposites because we had to balance each other out, you see. And so when we turn against religiosity with a vengeance and say, hey, all of that is there to play with the mind of humanity, then we lose our good vibration on our own power, you see. So hate always works against us. And I hated the establishment and the established religions because at that time where I lived, the Catholic Church was very much in control of the lives of people. And I thought it was really, really stupid. However, what I have come to see, you see, is that I added to the dark energy in the world. And so I had to say to myself, what am I going to do about that? Because I didn't figure it out while I was on earth. Now, what you have to understand, people, is that we've been around the wheel so many times that we've seen it all. And I've had lifetimes when I did get it and lifetimes when I didn't. And it's all about balancing each other out, you see. And so no matter where you are in the great wheel of life, God has to figure out how to balance everything out. And so if we're the one that didn't trust on God, or we're the one that thought God was a man with a long white beard who decided who went to heaven and who went to hell, even after he created them, which was so stupid, I didn't know how they could sell that hogwash to people. I mean, if God created you, then shouldn't he have just created you good? Instead of going through all the trouble of having to send you to hell and who the heck was the devil that was so stupid that he would want to spend eternity trying to stick pitchforks in people and burn them to death. What fun is that? Why wouldn't you rather just go lay on the beach and enjoy a nice day in the sun? I couldn't figure it out. However, what I did figure out in the end was that <laughs> My life was there to balance out hers, you see. And so there's no one size fits all, if this makes sense to you, other than the fact that life is there to be lived and to give. And no matter what precepts me may give you here, there's always another side, you see. And that's what we're trying to tell you. Trust on the ride. Trust on the ride. Trust on yourself to decide whether or not you have to take pride in your particular ride 
or whether you just say, well, this is my ride. This is what I say. This is what I do. Because in the end, you see, God has it in hand. God has it in hand. And if you can trust that God has it in hand, because of the inherent rules that give rise to life, you see. And we'll repeat it once again, because it bears repeating over and over and over again. Everything is love. But in order to experience itself, love had to divide into the lover and the beloved. And so if you love someone and they have gone to the other side, then you are here to balance them out, you see, because your mother has a good ride in heaven right now. And you're just here to miss her and feel the grief. But underneath the grief, you have to know that you have given her the greatest gift of all which is to know that she was so much loved by you that every day you get a little smile when you think of her because amid the tears there is a smile and that smile will reveal itself when you are done grieving because you will be leaving the pain behind because it's like saying the rain will end and the sun will come out and the sun will shine on you and everyone you knew because you'll come to see that everything you do is to balance out the trust on reality. Does this make sense to you? Yes. <clears throat> Are there any other questions or thoughts? For the life of me, all I can see is rainbows everywhere. Because after the rain, when the sun peeks through, then the colors in the air are the colors of me and you, you see. Because you and I will always fly high when we can let go of the suffering you see and accept the pain because the pain is not suffering they are two different things and this is a lesson i also had to learn this is steve because i had a lot of pain in my last years and i was thinking about that when you asked susan if people feel pain when they're dying I died for years and years, and I suffered through it all because I had a call from back home and I had to do it. I needed to suffer. I needed to suffer to balance out the suffering that I caused to others, you see. And I'm not talking about in this lifetime. I'm talking about the overall soul growth. So there's a lot of balancing that's going on. There's balancing between people and there's balancing between our own past and future, you see. And so if we just understand this, we will let it be. And that is a lesson that was brought home to me as well. That when you are very, very connected to someone at a soul level, you balance each other out. And so someone asked about being a slave. Sometimes you have to be the slave if somebody else that you love is the slaveholder, you see, in order to redeem their energy on a good trust, on love. Because love, you see, is to see and be seen. And 
in order to see and be seen, we need to see each other. And we need to love each other. We need to listen to each other. And so many a lifetime for me and the one you see has been with me being in a very controlling position and her being very controlled. You see? So lifetime after lifetime, step had to be the one that was controlled, the one that would be the slave or the oppressed member of humanity. However, it was just out of love for me. That's all. And if you can see the love, you will see that everything you do and everything you be is an expression of love. It is an expression of love. And that is the excellent story of humanity. And that is all perfect, you see, because we have to learn to be who we are so that we can be who we are. It's as simple as that. Like life is here for life. So we have to be who we are so we can be who we are. It's as simple as that. And when you can understand the perfection of God, you will understand the perfection of your life, you see. That every part is synchronized with all the other parts. And therefore, sometimes you'll be on the bottom of the wheel. Well, the one you love the best is on the top. Sometimes you'll be on the top of the wheel. Well, the one you love the best is on the bottom. But the key here is to come to see that it's not about all about you, you see, that you're not God. You are God in a fractal, if that makes sense to you. You are the parts and not the whole. And together, you make the whole. And sometimes you see it through a hole in the glass. You can sometimes look at reality as if everybody else is there to serve you. And sometimes you can look and see that you're there to serve the whole. You see? So just trust on love, which is to say just trust on seeing and being seen, doing what you do, on being heard and listening to others. And God will smile at you and the rainbows will fill the air because your colors will be bright, you see. And that's what we all love to see from here is when the colors are bright. Because they brighten up the night. Any other thoughts or questions? If not, we will terminate for today and let everybody go have a happy day. So thank you all for being in attendance and thank you for being so vulnerable, Susan, because your vulnerability was our ability to see the vulnerability of humanity. So we can just know that we are both the vulnerable ones and we are the ones who hold the power. It is the dichotomy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.